In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. We thank our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, for His infinite love, mercy, and compassion, allowing us, through His grace, to be in His holy presence, in His holy church, sharing His word, which is the truth and nothing but the truth. And may this tr truth set everyone who received it into freedom and an eternal one as well. I pray those who are with us in this holy church and those who are watching us through live streaming that you're always in good health and in good spirit in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. If I could ask everyone to stand for the Lord's Prayer, please. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today at our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgave our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Psalm number 121. <clears throat> I will lift up my eyes to the hills, from whence comes my help. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. The Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. Amen. May the Lord Jesus Christ bless you all, guide you and protect you forever and ever. Amen. Please take a seat. Well, a very good evening to everyone. How are we? Good. How are we? Good. How are we? Good. That's good. Well, we thank the Lord. Um, before we start our topic for this evening, um, if I could ask our beloved daughter in Christ, Jacqueline, to begin this evening with this church hymn or song. Please, Jacqueline. Amen. Well, we thank the Lord always, my beloveds, at all times, even when those times are difficult, we thank the Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, today, as most of the times, I came unprepared. I'm just kidding. <sighs> Sometimes we plan for things. And sometimes we prepare for things, but God has already had a different plan altogether. We may see things in a certain way. We may perceive things in a certain color, but God has always had it in place long ago before even creating anything and everything. So, we need to entrust everything in the Lord's mighty hand. And as the Lord Jesus from the cross, the most decisive, crucial, foundational moment of his life on earth, as he was giving, about to give the last breath, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Into your hands I commit my spirit for he had full trust that the God who has sent him forth to be the Savior and the Redeemer of the world is the same God who will deliver him from the pit from the depth of Sheol and bring him out 
from darkness into the light, from below to above, an absolute and complete and perfect exaltation, praise, and honor. And he will make sure that every, every knee will bow before the Lord Jesus' second coming. And every tongue will confess and profess that he is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. He is the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords. This is the promise from God the Father to his beloved and only begotten of the Father, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen. So we thank the Lord today and every day that has gone by and for many, many days to come ahead. And I pray that you have a very long life and a blessed one and a very fruitful one for the glory and honor and worship and praise of the name, the one and only, in whom salvation is only found and made possible, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Now... We thank the Lord. Today's topic is about relationship in Christianity. So if you, have, if you are not aware what the topic is about, please fasten your seat belts because you are in for a bumpy ride. Especially if you are already married and stuck with it. But those who are looking those who are searching for a partner, those who are still engaged, you still have the chance to change your mind. But if you're married, today's topic, to somewhat degree, it is for you, but to somewhat other degree, it is not for you because <laughs> you're already there. But it's good always to know because it's never too late. Amen? Amen. It's always good to know. Even if it's too late. <clears throat> now, relationship in Christianity. Where did this relationship come from? It all began when God said the following words. Why did relationship come about? I'm talking about human relationships here. It all began in Genesis 2.18. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18, the Lord God also said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. It is not God, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Who said this? The Lord God. So these words came and were uttered out of the mouth of God through his prophet Moses. And when God says something, it's done. No one can ever be able to change what God has already placed, put, created, stamp sealed. So it is not good for man to be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Who is this man? Adam. And who is the helper? Eve. Who is the helper? Eve. A small bit of information for you along the way. Our mother Eve was only called or named Eve after being deposed from the Garden of Eden by God himself. Along with Adam. Did you know what her name was while she was still in the garden, i.e. in the presence of the Almighty God. Her name in the Hebrew, Aramaic, Syriac, original text, which is Hebrew, and Aramaic, Syriac, Arabic are all Semitic languages. They are one family. So Hebrew, Aramaic, Arabic are one family. So when you go back to the original text, and see the name of Eve prior to being deposed from the Garden of Eden. Her name was Atta. Atta. That's the Hebrew Aramaic pronunciation. Atta. Now the word Atta is a compounded word. Two in one. At means you. Ta. Come. So what was her literal name? You come. That was her name. Imagine if I 
put this name on one of my beautiful daughters. What's your name? You come. No, no, I'm not coming. You, what's your name? You come. I'm not coming. What's your name? <laughs> so her name was Atta. You come. Why? Because God, the Lord God said, Adam, you are, it is not good for you to be alone. Therefore, I'm going to give you a helper, a comparable person to you. And I will call her, you come, Atta. Why? Because I'm going to call her and allow her to walk before you to give you the freedom of choice. When your eyes fall on her, I want you freely to say, I want her in marriage or I reject her. That's why I called her to you. You come to Adam and show yourself to him and let him look at you whether he's going to accept you as a wife or reject you. So that was her name. When they were kicked out of the garden, she was called Eve, the mother of all life. The mother of all life. It is not good for man to be alone. Now the word alone, we may think it is just, I'm just lonely. No. Alone is an abbreviation of all in one. Alone is all in one. It is not good for Adam, for all the, all the human race to remain in you. I need to bring the human race out of you, multiply, increase, and fill the whole earth. So the entire human race was in Adam. It is not good for man to be all in one. You cannot remain in Adam, I need to bring you out. And in order to bring you out, I will give you a helper comparable to you. I'll give you a woman. Now a woman is a man with a womb. So I'm going to give you someone to help you get the human race out of you. Where it is no longer alone, but all is in one. All this that is in one Adam, I'm going to bring them out to fill the whole earth and the way to bring the entire human race out of Adam, I'll give him a woman, a man with a womb and through their unity together, the entire human race will be able to come out of Adam and fill the earth. So he gave Adam and Eve, never ever Adam and Steve. This is God's plan. Now, you're not going anywhere, are you, tonight? Okay, good. I thought so. <laughs> I've canceled all your uh, appointments, dates, um, whatever you have. Where do you go? Where do you go? I come for you. Now, um, I'll read you this. This is just an information before we come into it. When we read in Genesis 2, it's not on the screen. When we read in Genesis 2, 22, verses 22 to 24. Genesis 2, verses 22 to 24, it reads as the following. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, a man with a womb, because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. One flesh. When God came to bring the woman out of the man, or Eve or Atta out of Adam, he put him, some say to sleep, full anesthetic, or it was a local anesthetic. Now, whether it was full or local, it really doesn't matter that much, as much it matters what God had done. Amazing. So he comes to Adam and takes one of the ribs, 
According to the church fathers, they say he took the rib from the left side of Adam, one of the ribs from the left side, and then he took that rib across the chest uh, uh, over the heart and brought that rib to the right side and made a woman for the man. Now, biblically speaking, left side means weakness. Right side means strength, support, sustainability. Now, when he brought the rib from the left side, he said to Adam, as long as you stay alone, you're weak. You need someone to help you. I'll give him a helper comparable to him. You need someone to help you, to support you, to sustain you, to be there for you in every moment of your life because alone you will never make it. You need a helper. So that's why I took the rib from your weakness, the left side, and then I created a woman and put her on the right hand of you. When we marry a couple in our church, I'm not talking about how things happen in other churches. When we marry a couple in our church, the bride always stands at the right side of the groom, not the left, at the right side, because she is his strength. Without her, he cannot make it. He cannot. This is God. So now, the rib came over the heart. Why the heart? Medically speaking, there is a very thin layer of skin that sits on the heart, works as a radiator in a vehicle. Imagine if the engine is running 24-7 non-stop. What will happen to it? It will overheat eventually if there was no, some sort of a, 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 a way of cooling down that hot engine. The cooling down of the engine is the radiator. So what does it mean? The woman is that radiator for the man's heart. When he is down, her role is to lift him up. When he is crying, she needs to comfort him. She is the helper. She is the helper. Not the nag, nag, nag. If the woman keeps on nagging, she will destroy her man. When he acts like a baby, you need to look after the baby, not say, pack your bag and go to mama. You cannot do that. You're there to comfort this baby. And don't men love it to act as babies in front of their wives? What's wrong, honey? Oh, I don't know. I'm not good at all. He just wants to hear a nice word that has been lacking for 25 years of marriage. He just wants to be spoiled. And instead, what does she do? Just get on with it. Grow up. You're a man. Okay, don't act like a little kid. You just broke his heart, poor thing. And a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. Now, some people may misunderstand this verse where the Lord God is saying it, to leave your father and mother, it doesn't mean that you deny your parents for your wife. No. Parents will always be parents and your wife will always be your wife. I always give this advice to couples who are in the process of getting married and even when they have marital issues. Don't ever, don't ever Mix the roles. If you as a man say to your wife, my mom and my dad come first, you come second, kiss goodbye your marital life. And if you say to your parents, my wife comes before you, you have destroyed your parents and you've lost them. I always say this. Parents are number one in their place, which God placed them in. And the wife is number one in her place, which no one can take it except her. So the wife is number one in her place. The parents are number one in their place. Don't ever mix. Everyone is number one. And when you approach this in this manner, there is no problem. 
Now, and the reason why the man leaves the parents, simple, because the Lord God said, and the two are no longer two, but one. The wife is the body, the man is the head to this body. So when you get married, the wife is your body. Your parents are not your body. They are totally separate from you. So who becomes the closest ever to you? Your body. Because the closest thing to the head is the body. They are one. The, the head cannot go on its own without the body. Neither the body can go out without the head. When the head goes on his own, remember you're taking your wife with you, even if she literally does not come with you. Are you with me? And when the wife leaves as a body, she takes the head with her, even if the man is still at home. Because wherever the head is, the body is. And wherever the body is, the head is. The two are inseparable from one another in the eyes of God. And this is why the man leaves his father and mother. Because father and mother are not my body to take them with me. The wife is my body. Wherever I go, the wife is with me. Therefore, in that matrimonial bond is the ultimate intimacy between the man and the woman. The closest ever. Christ came as the heavenly groom. Wow. Christ came to establish a relationship. There is no other relationship as close as this one where Christ is the groom and the church, i.e. the Christian people, are the body to this groom. He is the head and the church is the body. The two became one. God made you one in him. Wherever Christ goes, he takes us with him. And the same way, wherever we go, we should take Christ with us. So where are we taking Christ when we go? You need to think, where are you taking Christ? Because when Christ goes, he will take you to heaven. Don't ever take Christ to hell. Don't. Before I go any further, is it hot? Beside my presence, of course. It's not hot? Must be me then. Okay. St. Paul calls this bond between Christ and the church, the body of Christ, he calls it the great mystery. He calls it the great mystery in his epistle to the Ephesians. The great mystery. Why is it the great, not a great, the great mystery? Why? Because the entire Old Testament never ever realized that God wants us to be one in him. This was a mystery to the entire human race until Jesus Christ was revealed at the river Jordan to the entire world. And then by the grace of Christ, when he gave us the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit revealed it to the apostles and the church fathers thereafter that this was the plan of God. He wants us to be one in him, with him forever. We become the body and he becomes the head to this body, inseparable. And what attaches, what connects the body to the head? The neck. What connects the body to the head? The neck. When we dress up, especially in winter, the neck is covered, but the head is revealed. The most revealed member of the entire body is the face, the cheeks. These don't get covered. I hope you don't. We'll come to it when we do the Song of Songs. But the neck represents faith. Neck is the weakest member in the entire body. When you break the neck, a human, that could lead them into being dead. It's a very fatal wound. So 
the neck is very weak and what connected us to Christ our weakness is not our strengths God will never look for strong people he will always look for those who say I am weak I cannot do it without you God but if somebody says I can do it on my own I can survive with my own intellectual capacity God cannot work in people that are strong he will only work for those in those who say I cannot do it you need to help me and this is why one of the church fathers came and, and said he said Satan went to God once and said give me the strong don't give me the weak because I can win with the strong I can never overcome the weak because you God work through the weak when God created the woman he took her out of the rib from the left side of the man the weakness not the strength right hand from the weakness and then out of this weakness of the man he made a woman that will sustain support and strengthen the man in his weakness now my goodness I haven't even started you're not going home tonight let me now come back a little bit I'll take you back a bit before we go forward there are four stages and this is clinically speaking and if there are doctors here please correct me if I am wrong because I don't claim to be a doctor because I'm not so I hope I'm not wrong clinically speaking there are four stages before the baby is born before the baby is born stage one number one pre embryonic stage number two embryonic stage number three fetal and stage four baby is born pre embryonic the age of that is zero um, I want to make how do you make zero without thinking it's a sign of whatever it is <laughs> long time ago during lock, lockdowns like normally Middle Eastern people talk like that and I'll show you I'll fix you up they thought I was a Freemason I said listen brother I'm just a Middle Eastern okay relax so it's it's uh, it's zero okay <laughs> and when you when you sort of turn it inside from the top it becomes I love you <laughs> I'm nothing but I still love you baby <laughs> so it's a big zero okay pre embryonic is zero stage embryonic is the time when that baby now the zero stage is when the baby is conceived in the mother's womb for the first moment of their life the moment of conception that's the stage of pre-embryonic is prior to that prior to that but the moment the baby is conceived in the mother's womb till the age of two months that's embryonic stage so pre-embryonic is zero prior to zero embryonic from zero to two months fetal from two months to nine months and the fourth stage baby now is formed is complete it is at the age of nine months it must come out into this world from the small world of mommy's womb into this big wide world of trouble and noise pollution when we take this clinical stages and turn them into our literal life what is the pre embryonic stage when the baby is born when the baby comes that's the age of zero the moment the baby born how old are you I just started I don't have an age it's today zero embryonic when that baby grows and becomes a teenager fetal when that baby who became a teenager in the fetal stage now he's mature he's looking for a woman 
That's fetal. And the fourth stage, baby is born, is the time when the couple stand before the holy altar and the priesthood rank and say to each other, I do. In marriage, I do. So baby born is when the two get married. Please pay attention, especially if you are looking for a partner, if you are engaged, if you are married and you don't have kids as yet. Or if you have still children, still very, very young, not adults, more so. There are four stages in every single one of us life that are absolutely crucial. Four phases of our life that are absolutely crucial into determining what kind of a person I'll end up being. What kind of a personality I'll end up with. Very crucial. The first stage is the pregnancy phase. The time when I am in my mother's womb. Now, please, my daughters, pay attention. And my son as a husband. When your wife has conceived there is a baby in her womb... What you need to do is to help your wife never ever to be angry, never ever to be in turmoil, never ever to be agitated while the baby is in the mother's womb. Let me tell you why. The baby while in the mother's womb is so smart, he, they will surpass our intelligence. So smart. Everything the mother feels, the baby feels. Everything the mother says, the baby feeds on. The baby feeds on. Example, if the mother is angry, the baby will be born with anger in them, whether it's a boy or a girl, and it will be seen once they are grown older. If the mother is broken, the baby will come out and you'll see them quiet. But if the mother is boiling up, if the mother is really upset, angry, the baby will come born, you'll see them never sleeping well, not eating well, crying a lot of times, and you'll say, I don't know what's wrong with my baby. You take them to the doctor, the doctor most of the times, unless there is a medical issue, but most of the times they will say, there is nothing wrong with your baby, take him or her back home. Why then the baby is not eating, is angry, is upset? Because while the baby was in the mother's womb, the mother was upset, angry, disappointed, and you name it. The psychological effect on the child is the most crucial ever. Psychological effect can scar that baby in the mother's womb for the rest of their life. But we thank God for Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Ah, see? We thank God for Jesus Christ, his beloved son. In pregnancy stage, one of the most crucial times, you want for your baby to be healthy, you want... You want for your baby to be healthy in every aspect, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, physically. Be happy, mother. And my son, help your wife to be happy and to be comfortable. Because what goes around will come around. The baby is feeding on the mother, even her own emotions. Now, the second stage that affects us immensely is when the baby is born from the time they are born till the age of three the first three years are foundational after birth how you deal with the baby 
how you treat the baby, this will be carried with them for the rest of their life. And let me tell you this, when someone, far from all of you, when someone loses their memory, whether they call it dementia, whatever it is, when they lose their memory, they are probably in their 80s, in their 90s. You ask them what you did five minutes ago, they will not know, but they will tell you in details what happened when they were a little child. Wow. Wow, because this is foundational. Foundational. They will remember every childhood event. But five minutes ago, I don't know what I ate. I don't know who I spoke to. I don't know who I am. The first three years. Let me tell you, my beloved parents. You may come and say, Father, my son is lying to me. Now, I'm talking now in general here. I'll get to the stage where they pick up on a lot of things externally to their family circle. But in general, imagine this. A little kid always loves to play with the phone and answer the phone. Imagine your phone as a father rings. You have a three, four-year-old child. They'll run to the daddy's phone and they know how to slide it. And they'll say, hello. The other person says, is daddy home? The child looks at daddy. Daddy with the sign language. I'll finish you off if you tell him I'm home. Daddy's not home. Now this child brain is not fully mature to understand what a lie is all about. The child now is confused. He looks, daddy is home, but daddy is saying to me to tell the other person on the line, daddy is not home. I cannot comprehend what daddy is trying to teach me. I don't comprehend what daddy is trying to teach me. All I know, he's home, but he's saying, don't say I'm home. So with a confused answer, um, no home, bye. That kid grows older, becomes a teenager, and then he walks through the front door of your house, and you ask your child, where did you come from? Were you at school? The child says, yes, dad, I was at school. Then a few days later, you find out that he was lying all along. And when you confront your son or your daughter, why did you lie to daddy? They will say, you lied to me when I was a little kid. I learned it from you, dad. Thank you so much. I learned it from you. Another thing. Parents don't ever do it. And I know we fail. Don't ever discipline your child with a smack. This is a baby. The baby is trying to understand. The baby is trying to prove a point. Now let me tell you one thing. Nothing in this life comes for free. When that baby is the reason for your laughter, he'll say it will cost you. I don't make your life for free, mom and dad. You will need to pay it back because nothing is for free anyway. If anybody says it's for free, they're lying. Nothing is for free. So when that baby was the reason, when you came home from work and you had a tough day, and then you come and the baby makes a gesture. And then go, 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 go. And then daddy starts laughing and smiling. And, and the environment changes from a bad one into a good one. The child is saying, I was the reason for your happiness, dad. Now you have to pay for it. How are you going to pay for it, dad? Dad will say to that child, don't touch this place. The child says, no, you have to pay for it. I will touch it. Don't open this drawer, I'll open it. Don't pour the milk on the couch, I will. Because I don't make you happy for free. And secondly, 
Just like you are part of the family member, I am also a family member. So you better respect my opinion, my thought, and my way. You do it your way, Dad. You better do it my way sometimes as well. So you tell me, you tell me don't do this, I'll do it. I'll do it. What do we do? Especially nowadays, nobody is patient. We blow up. I told you, that's a three, four year old. I told you three times, don't do that. Mm. Smack. The baby grows, remembers the smack. He'll pay it one day back <laughs> to mom and dad. He'll pay it one day back. No one was born to be bad. No one. It's just things that we picked up along the way that made us who we are after maturity. The other crucial time, and I don't have the time to go through it all. The other crucial time is from the ages of 6 to 13. And then the fourth one is from the ages of 13 to 18. And congratulations, mom and dad, when your son or your daughter reaches the age of 18, that's it. They have formed the personality and the person they wish to be and choose to be. Now, what happens? The foundation of that personality is mom and dad, home. The other way is the most influential relationship after mom and dad is friends. Oh, what a feeling, Corona. The most influential relationship after mom and dad are the friends. And when we become 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, all the teen, teen, teen. We become after the 18, Thomas the Tank. Choo, choo, choo. What friends have you chosen for yourself? And what friends have you allowed them to be influential in your life? This will be the second most influential relationship after parents, friends. In fact, friends can be more influential than your own mom and dad. Because what I cannot say to mom and dad, I say it to my friends. And what I cannot do in front of my mom and dad, I do it with my friends. Because my friends gave me the freedom to be who I wish to be. Parents never allow me to be what I want. They want me to be as they wish. The only ones who are true to me are my friends because they let me be who I am. Wow. So who do I listen to? Friends. So along the way from the, preg from the mother's womb till the age of 18, the first nine months, crucial. The first three years after birth, crucial. From 6 to 13, crucial. From 13 to 18, crucial. After 18, the tree is ripe. The trunk is fully mature. You cannot bend that trunk anymore. You want to straighten the tree while it's soft. Straighten it. Tie it to a stick and make sure it grows straight. The moment it's ripe and mature, good luck going and straightening the trunk. You will break the tree. And this is what happens when parents try to discipline their children after maturity. They make them run away from home. The tree is broken. The tree is broken. When I reach the age of 18, what have I learned from mom and dad? What have I learned from school? What have I learned from the world? What have I learned from my friends? What have I learned from social media? What have I learned? What have I seen? What, are, what did I allow myself to be exposed to? This will shape me and mold me into the human being that I become after 18. So along the way, I said, you know what? Um, I like lying because I can get away with it. So I'll be a liar. Um, I'm going to be angry because that will really make people respect me. I put fear into them when I shout and break things. 
So I'll be an angry person. It is the emotional, the emotional journey that affects us. Psychology is important. And this is why for those people who claim that mother nature made us, you are wiping the faculty of psychology. So it can't be mother nature that made us. Why are you teaching psychology in universities? Might as well just wipe it out. Because psychology doesn't go with the hand of mother nature made me. Because mother nature has no emotions. Mother nature has no feelings. Mother nature has no love. Mother nature has none of that. But psychology is all about this. They will tell you mentally how you are, physically how you are, emotionally how you are, and they'll try to bring you out of whatever trouble you're going through. None of this exists in mother nature. Mother nature is pre-wired. One plus one equals two. That's it. End of story. There is no emotions in mother nature. So I just don't know what they talk about. After 18, the person is formed and whatever characteristics I've carried along, this is what I, who I'm going to become. But that was not me when I was born. I was a little doe, very fragile. My parents could have molded me, shaped me, whichever the way they wanted. A baby cannot reject or stand against mom and dad, but the adult can. So mom and dad, when you had that baby, did you take that baby to church? No. Did you read the Holy Bible while putting the baby to sleep? No. Did you show love to the baby as mom and dad? How did you act before that baby? Did you show that you love one another, respect one another, agree with everything together, not one opposite to the other? Not when the baby goes to dad and says to him, no, then he runs to mom and mom says, yes, you've destroyed your baby. What have you done here? You have put confusion in the baby's mind that mom is good, dad is bad. Or mom is bad, dad is good. And when mom is bad, when I grow older and I get married, I'll be never nice to a female. Because my mom, who is a female, was never nice to me. Or when dad was bad to mom. As a girl, I'll marry. I'll either be exactly like my dad, or I will never ever go anywhere near my dad because he was very bad to my mom. I'll do the opposite. But it's a 50-50. Not a very big percentage. It could go either way. But when parents agree, and a piece of advice, please, mom and dad, if anybody told you that parenthood is a holiday, you're mistaken. Who told you that parenthood is easy? It is the most difficult, the most troublesome of all and God expects from parents to raise the children for him not for anyone else for him it is the most responsible area of your life ever in fact marriage is the foundation of this realm foundation without marriage there is no life where did the children come from? Where did this life come from? That's why, my beloved, as parents, as parents, you are co-creator with God. You share the creation with God. God creates a human. As husband and wife, you also create a human. You make one. You are like God in this. Look how much God has granted you this priceless gift by making you the creators as well, like Him. You become co-creators with God and guess what the only place where a human is created is in marriage 
when the man and the woman get together there is no other place I'm talking in the natural way not in the weird way of the 21st century sick sick way evil way godless way but I'm talking in the natural way godly way divine intervention the only place where a human is created is in marriage no other place because Adam and Steve cannot create it is Adam it takes Adam and Eve to make a human possible and enough of this nonsense bunch of fools not realizing their head from their toes parents piece of advice I know life is very difficult it's not easy there is a lot of responsibilities there is a lot of things I need to attend to especially nowadays everything is gone up in prices I cannot afford I'm running I'm, I'm working two jobs the husband and the wife are working they're leaving the children if they are not fortunate to have grandparents to look after them there is the kindergarten there is that preschool there is that child care center but let me tell you one thing I know sometimes we cannot help it we cannot do much about it I need to put my child in a child care center in order for me to go to work because one wage is never enough two wages we are barely making it it's hot turn the aircon down a bit thanks brother I was just gonna say that and I saw you going like that and I said that's it I'm gonna make the call an executive decision turn the aircon make it cooler so both parents are working they, not everybody has the privilege and the blessing of grandparents and don't grandparents come extremely handy when you have children oh my goodness let me tell you this daughter don't ruin it with your mother-in-law because she will be very pri precious for you in the future in the near future so don't ruin it with your in-laws be nice to them because you will may have to call them and say mother can I bring my baby to you because I need to go back to work I've been off work for the last 12 months we are struggling if I don't go I'll be leave with that pay cannot afford it so please mother-in-law she'll say well since you've been nice to me no problem bring the baby and since we mentioned grandparents let me tell you this fact that you may not have been aware of as grandparents do you know why you love your grandchildren more than your children have you ever thought of it you know why for one simple fact you see when you had your own children you were too busy working to provide for them and give them the best of the best so while you were working you missed out on their childhood you missed out on their youthhood all of a sudden as a father you saw your son 21 you saw your daughter 21 but what happened to all these 21 years I was busy my son sorry I had to work 50 hours a week and I was working even the weekends just to make sure you have a beautiful bright successful future and when I came to enjoy my son and my daughter they were already adults and they went found a partner and flew away before I became their friend so what do I do as, as, as a father and a mother I'll wait for the grandchildren to come because the grandchildren are your true children that you missed out on growing with them now when the grandchildren came I slowed down as a father I was young when my son was born I didn't have the time for my son but when the grandson came I am in my 60s I am in my 70s automatically I've slowed down maybe now I'm on I, I'm receiving pension so as a pensioner I have all the time under the sun 
I'll take my grandchild to the park. I'll take my grandchild to a walk. I'll take them to shops. I'll buy them lollies. I'll buy them chocolates, presents, whatever they want. Why? Because I say to myself, I never saw my son, but I'm seeing my grandson as my true son, where I'm spending all the time with them. And this is why we love them more than our children. We never saw our children, but we saw our children in our grandchildren. But sometimes, as this person puts it so beautifully, he says, there are certain people, they spread joy and happiness wherever they go and whenever they go. Did you get that? There are certain people, they spread joy and happiness wherever they go and whenever they go. Grandchildren, when they come, they bring joy and happiness. And when they leave, they leave with joy and happiness because I've had enough with them. Come, my son, get your children out of here. They've given me nothing but a hard time. But anyway... Parents... I know life is hard. I know life is tough. You come back from work, both of you working very tired, and then there's a lot of demands toward this child. So the best thing to do, I'll give him a mobile or an iPad, whatever, and just keep him busy off my shoulders. He take this toy and play with it because mommy's tired, daddy's tired. And they flip through that phone, and they flip through those things, and God knows what they see. Or I'm too busy sitting in the garage and smoking the argila. Or I'm too busy with my friends. Parents have the biggest responsibility. We need, we need to make sure that the children are fed and fed correctly. Because at the end of the day, with all love and respect, with all love and respect, I'm saying this, no one is the same as mom and dad. No matter how much you love the child, you can never give them that emotional, that mental, that spiritual food as mom and dad would do to their own kids. No matter who you are and what you are, the child is in need 100% of mom and dad. And this is why Two parents with the same sex, disastrous. Disastrous. That's another reason why it's not from God. Because let me tell you this. What affects and drives the man is logic. What affects and drives the woman is feelings and emotions. This is why when a man goes shopping... It's totally different to a woman going shopping. Imagine the man wants to buy a pair of pliers. They go to Bunnings. The first entry at the front entry of, of Bunnings, they see this beautiful, beautiful young man or woman standing there. He will say, excuse me, where can I find a pair of pliers? Oh, it's aisle number 31. Thank you. He will go to aisle 31 and he will go straight to the pliers, grab him and run out of there as quick as possible. Even Speedy Gonzalez with all of his might will not reach you with that speed. Arriba, arriba, andale. You want to go for some lunch, some dinner, you know? So you'll be Speedy Gonzalez straight to aisle 31, get the pliers and out of there, Bunnings. The woman goes shopping. See, that's logic. Logic sometimes is dumb. Uh? So you took all the effort in changing and sitting in the car and warming it on a very cold winter day and drove 20 half an hour to Bunnings just for two minutes. What a shame. But the logic says one plus one equals two. I want a pair of pliers. That's what I'm going to get. The woman is affected by the emotions and feelings. She'll take you shopping with her. 
if you try to teach her to be you, <laughs> you'll be sleeping in the street that night, baby. So she'll take you shopping. She wants to buy a box of tissues. Simple. How many levels is Parramatta Westfield? Five. She will take you through the entire five levels, even the car park with it. And she will go to every single shop. I don't know how many shops is there, 10,000, 20, I don't know. She will stop at every single shop from diamonds to gold to silver to linen to everything. And after 222 hours, she'll go and get that box of tissue. You are finished, gone with the wind. Every part in your body is aching. And then you'll argue, why didn't you just go and get, why da, 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 da? no. That's how God made her, feelings. She needs to feel everything, baby. Oh, let me see. Oh, look, they have a discount here, honey. Look at this, look at this furniture. Honey, you wanted a box of tissue. No, no, please, please, please. Oh, look at the smell of the leather. Wow. And then she goes and sits once, 10 times, 20 times, still not enough. I want to feel it. I want to smell it. Okay, let's go now. <laughs> you like that one, huh? Because you know it's, it's true. <laughs> that's why you're laughing. You see, we laugh when we hit the sensitive chord. Oh, that's me. Woo <laughs> Poor the man is pushing the trolley. Oof. Oof. But he can't say anything. He'll be sleeping as a, at, uh, at his parents' house. He doesn't want to do that. All right. Or maybe he does. <laughs> well, if you want to sleep at your parents, just nag, nag. Okay? <laughs> She'll take you home. <laughs> so parents, when you have a child, you need to spend time with that child no matter how tired you are. Speak the language of love. Hello, honey. Hello, my angel. I missed you all day I was working. Mommy was working. I miss you, mommy. I love you, mommy. You are my love. You're my heart. You're my life. You, I wish I, I didn't have to work, but mommy works because of you. She does it for you. But it's okay, mommy. Mommy's here now. Come, my child. I'll take that child to their room. I'll put them after my lap, after my bosom. I put them in their crib, in their bed. And then mommy stays because the child misses mommy, misses daddy. And both parents need to come sit with this baby, put this baby to sleep. What are you in? What are you investing in that baby? You are putting in them something called security peace comfort confidence I think it's getting cold <laughs> and the ultimate you read to that baby is the word of the Lord read them a bedtime story and you better choose that story to be the Holy Bible. There are so many beautiful children Bibles. Amazing. A couple of lines, but it's imprinted in that child, engraved in that child. The child is getting their ease adjusted to the Word of God, to the voice of the Lord. When they grow older, they will automatically go to church because it's been embedded in those first three years. And before that, while he is in your womb, my daughter, read the Holy Bible as husband and wife together while the baby is in the womb because the baby will get used to that beautiful voice. Trust me. Uh, when the time comes to an end, I feel miserable. 
This is the only time I breathe. After you leave, I suffocate. No good. Now we come into the topic. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll breeze through it, don't worry, I'll breeze through it. Now, the baby's born. The baby now is, an, is a, a teenager, is an, an, is an adult, mature, is looking for a partner. Mom and dad, when the baby is in the mother's womb, from that moment, speak to the baby. Teach the baby to be generous, to be a giver, not a receiver. You have no idea what God has created. Life is very complex. The human being is very complex. The brain, with all the medical advancement, they are nowhere near how the brain functions. Nowhere near. Beyond complexity for the human intellect to fathom. And then you say it came because something exploded over 13 13 and a half billion years ago. Are you serious? Speak to that baby. Say, my child, if you're a boy or if you're a girl, doesn't matter as long as you're healthy. I thank God for you. But my child, I want you to learn. Speak, mama. Dada, speak. Speak to that baby and say, darling, when you come, Okay, you be nice, you be kind, you always help, you always give. Don't be greedy, don't be selfish, don't just think of you, think of others before you. Teach them on how to learn to be a giver. For cheerful is the hand that gives, says the Lord. For cheerful is the hand that gives. Teach them because they don't know. You are the parents. You are the teachers. You need to teach the child to learn how to be a giver. How to be kind to others. Because one day this son will be a husband. And one day this daughter will be a wife. And when they become one, they will know how to respect one another and be kind to one another, forgiving towards one another. You need to teach them from the womb and when they come out to this world always say be kind be nice give my child do not be afraid God always provides don't fear when you help someone even if it's financial help whatever you give God will give you back a hundred folds moreover teach them to be generous generous because this is the truth are we going to take with us everything we save and sleep on? No, the grave will take it away from us, whether we like it or not. Be generous, be nice, be kind. Give, be that giving hand, be that helping hand. Teach them from the womb till they are adults, teach them. I'll have to breeze through this. And you probably heard me say this before. And I always quote this verse when it comes to marriage. When a couple comes and talks to me personally, I always quote them Proverbs 31.10. Proverbs 31.10 is King Solomon. And it teaches you wisdom, how to be wise on earth. How to be wise on earth. Proverbs 31.10 is one verse that can be divided into two parts. The first part is for the man, and the second part is for the woman. What it, which is the part for the man? It says, who can find a virtuous wife? It's a question mark. King Solomon is asking us, who can find a virtuous wife? That's for the man. The second one is for the woman. For her worth is far above rubies, precious stones. For her worth is far above rubies, precious stones. 
Who can find a virtuous wife? What does the word virtuous mean? Literally fearing the Lord. Fearing means loving Jesus Christ of Nazareth. King Solomon through his wisdom, which he received from God himself, is saying to every man, if you are looking for a girl in marriage, you better look for a girl that loves Jesus Christ of Nazareth. You know why, my son? Because when you find a fear, a, 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 a God-fearing woman, never be afraid of her because the Lord who is in her will never teach her to be nasty to you. So the man should not look mainly for the external looks. Son, my son. Oh, Bishop, look at this gazelle. Man, I hit the jackpot. Look at her height. Look at the hair. Look at the face. Look at the eyes. She's stunning, brother. She will give you hell. Don't get me wrong. The looks are important because you don't want to wake up the first day after honeymoon and call RSPCA. <laughs> I just wanted to make you laugh. Please don't get offended. All right. <laughs> Currently, I have one eye until the Lord gives me the other one, but I still have the red belt in karate. So don't come. <laughs> you know why I said that? Because my son, this will be the first time you will see her without makeup. I thought I married Mariah Carey. Who is this? <laughs> okay. <laughs> look, the, the external looks are important, but they are not the most important. The most important is the internal looks, not the external. Because whether we like it or not, time will take away the external looks. The woman gets married, has few children, Man, see you later. <laughs> and since she's married someone who is a pain in the neck, she'll age very quickly. So that good looking girl at 21, she's not going to be the same at 51. So the external looks are important, but the most important of all is the heart. Is her heart with the Lord or not? This is the first question you ask when you meet a girl for the first time. Ask her, do you love Jesus? If she says no, don't be a saint and try to convert her. Give it some time, but not too long. Because she may convert you, more than likely. Because the woman has a lot of influence on the man. More than the man to the woman. That's why King Solomon through his wisdom says to the man, find a girl that loves the Lord because she will take you to heaven with her. Not to hell. She will take you to heaven. Because mom for 30 years tried to make me do one thing, she failed. This woman I met yesterday, she makes me do everything under the sun for her. Wow. I wouldn't even clean my room. I'm cleaning the garden <laughs> inside and outside the house and on the rooftop as well. <laughs> because my woman said, you're my man, go and clean the house. <laughs> Tarzan, here we come. So she is the most influential in your life. Find the girl that is God-fearing. She will make you a saint. She will make you a saint. And so many men came to Christ because of their wives. <sighs> Am I talking too much? Do you want me to continue? I won't be that long. It's another two hours. That's all. A virtuous woman who can find? Who can find a virtuous wife? Look for a wife, for a girl that loves the Lord. For her worth is far above rubies, precious stones. This is for the girl. He's saying, King Solomon, to the girl, find a man that will see you, my daughter, in his eyes more precious than precious stones. And what is more precious than precious stones? First Peter 1, 18 to 19, St. Peter tells us what is more precious than stones and pearls. 
First Peter 1, 18 to 19. Knowing that you were not redeemed, purchased. Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ. So what is more precious than pearls and stones? The blood. We were redeemed by the blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. So what is blood here? Life. My life is determined by the blood. The blood goes, I die. So what is more precious than pearl and precious stones? Life. He says, my daughter, look for a man that is willing to put his life on the line for you. And look for a girl that loves the Lord, my son. When you look for a girl that loves the Lord, fear nobody. And when you find a man that is willing to die for you, i.e. sacrifice for you, go for that man. Now, when are we going to understand this concept from the womb of our mother? From those first three years after birth and until the age of 18, I will understand everything my parents taught me and thank God for it because he is the ultimate teacher. Um, I'll leave you with this. <laughs> you know when we said pre-embryonic in the clinical um, terminology, that's when the baby is born. Embryonic is when the baby is a teenager. Fetal when the baby is now an adult. And baby when the baby is born in the clinical as, you know, t terminology is when that couple are getting married on their big day the wedding day. So what happens on the wedding day? The baby is born. You see, the first time I was a baby, embryo, pre-embryonic, I was a baby born. Parents taught me to be nice, to be kind, to be helping, to be this, to be that, all the beautiful things I was taught. When I grew and I became a teenager, I started fathoming what my parents have taught me all these years and when I became more mature and adult I started looking for a partner in marriage when I looked for a partner in marriage whatever I was taught I looked in that girl or for that man a piece of advice my son when you find a girl and your heart starts dancing from, in, from within for the first time, you go up to her and you approach her and you want to get to know her. Here's what you need to do if you haven't, done, if you haven't found one yet. Uh, those who are married, I said it's too late. Um, you go to her and, and then you get to know her for three months, not more. And during these three months, normally you need to go back to your spiritual father and update your spiritual father with what is been happening throughout these three months. Don't take it into your own hands. You're playing with fire. So you go out, you talk, exchange words, you go back to your spiritual father. Say, we had this kind of a conversation. This is what I said, this is what she said. Or this is what I said, then this is what he said. What do you say, father? Okay, continue, it's okay. Three months, you should be able to make a very clear decision whether you continue with the relationship or walk away. Because by the three months are up, you will have a good idea if this person speaks your language or not. You will know them. You will know them. The way you talk and the way they respond, you know. If you are a church person and all they talk about worldly, what are you doing? You're in a, in a very wrong relationship. You're still, you're, you are there just for the looks. What looks? 
We need to be wise. Wise. So after three months, you decide, shall I continue, give it more chance or not? If you say yes, you should be married maximum within 18 months, year and a half. You should be married. This relationship must be stamped, sealed, finalized, settled. When you buy a house, they say there is a settlement date. Well, you're going to put a deposit and wait 10 years? <laughs> you need to settle within a certain time. If you don't settle, there are penalties. And you may lose the house and the deposit which you put 10%. It's a big, hefty penalty. So after a year and a half, if you are still in the relationship, three years, four years, five years, I will ask you this and you better be honest. Don't, aren't you encountering a lot of problems? 100% yes. You know why? Because after two years and above, every man and his dog will enter and interfere with your relationship. Because he didn't seal it. Problems will start. When are you going to get married? The in-laws are getting on your back. Come on, our daughter is not cheap. You better, you better settle this matter. You better marry her. Otherwise, we don't want to see your face. Problems. Friends come in. Cousins come in. Everyone will come in. You, and then, the more you leave it, the more you're not able to settle the matter. You should be married a year and a half. From the day you've met that person for the first time, Till the wedding day, it should be not more than 18 months, maximum two years. Don't put, after two years, kiss it goodbye. There's a lot of problems now. You know why it's a problem? I'll tell you why. Because you got used to each other outside the marital house. <laughs> I don't want you now. I'm used to you. Okay, you're not happy? Okay, see you. And when you say see you after all these years, what happened to the heart? It's shattered. Shattered. Because there's a lot of emotions here. The deposit is lost. The matter was never settled. So you need to settle. You can't just say, oh, I don't know, look, I'll give it another chance. I'll give it another. And it's been five years. What other chance? Like this man, young man, he went to the priest. He said, Father, yes, son. I've known this girl for, for, the, for the past four years. And I don't know, Father. Tell me, shall I marry her or not? The father kicked him so hard in the backside. And he said, get out of my office I'm not, I'm not the one who's marrying her, it's you. Why are you asking me after four years? Get out of my room. What do you mean, Father, shall I marry her? You've been going out with her for four years and you can't decide. Now you're telling me to decide for you? You don't want to marry her? Don't. You want to marry her? Go. But don't ask me after four years. You should have come from day one. You should have come from day one. So... You need to settle. And I need to settle. <laughs> I'm running out of time. <laughs> Even though I don't want to leave you. And, oh, are you praying for me? Please continue. I need your prayers. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Um, now... In the good olden days, why marriage lasted a lifetime? Because it was chosen wisely. See, now people meet on the net. Oh, I, I met my partner on Facebook. What kind of a face is he going to give you? A face of a book. But he, on, he was not going to give you his face. He'll give you a different face. See, in the good olden days, when they wanted to 
go and ask for a, a hand of a girl for their son, the parents, they will ask two things or two questions. One, who are the parents? Two, who are the friends? One, who are the parents? Two, who are the friends? Because when you find out who the, who the parents are, find out who the friends are, because maybe the parents are good, but as that person grew older and mixed with people and made friends for themselves, those friends influenced that person and took them the wrong way. When you find who the friends are, you will know exactly what kind of a person you're asking for their hand. You'll know exactly. Because you know why? Friendship is chosen using the head. Relationship in marriage is chosen using the heart, not the head. The first healthiest step to a partner in marriage, your heart must choose that partner, not your head. If you choose your partner in marriage using your head, you will live very tired for the rest of your life in that relationship. But if, you, if your heart chooses them, no, you'll live happy. Because for a marital relationship, it takes the heart to make it happen, then the head. But friendship, you never use the head. Why? Because you never use the heart, sorry, in friendship. Because you need to choose your friend with your head unless the, their way of thinking is like or similar to your way of thinking, you can never be friends. You can never be friends. The reason why they are friends because you think alike, not you feel alike. You think alike. That's why you are friends. So friendship requires the intellect. Relationships in marriage requires the heart first, then the head. And this is why after marriage, prior to marriage, the head is asleep, the heart is awake. So prior to marriage, <laughs> All the words that come out of you, my son, is you've surpassed Romeo. <laughs> Hello, my love. Hello, my darling. What's happening, baby? Every day you call her one name. One day she is your uh, uh, sunshine. The other she is your flower. The other she is your rosella, your gazelle, your honey, your sugar bun, your babe, your everything. After marriage, what? Whatever. I've been married to you for a long time. So we need to use the heart first in that relationship, then use the head afterwards. So my beloveds, use wisely. And whatever issues you're having, you need to share it with the Lord. With the Lord. Not going and talking to your friends about it. If someone has the same level of intellectual capacity as you, what do you think they're going to advise you on? It's like an alcoholic, with all of and respect, an alcoholic going to another alcoholic and asking that person, uh, uh, my, what do you say? Shall I give up on alcohol? What do you think the other person is going to say? Of course not. So you cannot go to someone who is same level as you and ask him for advice. You need to go for someone who is much wiser than you, older than you, more experienced than you, and ask them for advice. In short, relationships are vital because they are from God. It is not good for Adam, for man, to be alone. That's where relationship began. He can't be alone. He needs a partner. He needs a helper. So it's, it's his God's. That's why we cannot stop it. But what we need to do, we need to do it God's way so we don't get hurt along the way. Amen? Amen. So my beloveds, I wish you all the very best. Those who are still single, my best advice for you is remain as you are. <laughs> and those who are engaged, you still have the chance to walk away before it's too late. And those who are married, may the Lord have mercy on all of us. <laughs> And please don't come and see me. I don't have the time for you. Keep your trouble to yourself. Have a Kit Kat. Have a break. <laughs> Just kidding. Not. <laughs>
Well, I pray we've learned something, even if it may be small, today. Um, I pray and I ask the Lord Jesus to, to guide you all, to protect you all, and to fill your life with His love and His joy and happiness. Whether you are single, whether you are engaged, or whether you are married, I pray nothing but love, joy, happiness for your life. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. All right. Now we're going to hear one more hymn from our beloved Jacqueline. Is that Jacqueline and Eddie? Jacqueline and Eddie. Yes, let's hear a hymn and then a couple of announcements, and we say, go in peace. Uh, well, say it now. Guess what day it is today? It is your I, birthday. I honestly <laughs> forgot. I, I, you know, yeah. when, I, when I talk about the Lord, I, I forget myself, and that's the truth. Uh, this, is, this is Him, uh, because he'll, His love suffices every other love. Yeah. So I, I totally forgot, even though I was given a beautiful, beautiful balloons by a, beautiful, a handsome young man, this, uh, this evening, and I brought it into the church, but honestly, I just totally forget, <laughs> I forgot because the Lord just took me somewhere else. It's all good, Satan. So um, it'll only take me 10 hours now of your time. I'm a good I'm teacher. I'm joking. Um, so if I can ask all the beautiful people um, present here at the church and all the ones that are watching in the live streaming to say the count of three with one voice, join in and say, happy birthday, your grace. We love you. Okay? So it's one, two, three. Happy birthday, your grace. We love you. I love Yay. you. I love you and I love you. Happy birthday, Sayedna. Um, Thank you. For many, many happy and healthy returns. Uh, God bless you for us always. And as I always say, uh, my name is Bishop Murray. I am single and available. I'm hot. You're not. Thank you very much. God bless you. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you so much. And since it is your birthday, um, the next hymn that we will sing is a, a beautiful, well-known hymn that I'm sure all of you have heard it. Um, but this version is a special one. Uh, since my dear brother Eddie here has changed a little bit of the lyrics with it a few years back. Yeah. Um, now, we're going to sing it together as a duet. I hope you'll enjoy it. Um, and yes. Amen. This, um, Mary, did you know, is a very famous uh, song. Uh, a while back, our beloved Eddie, he changed some of the lyrics to fit it for my earthly mother, who has moved on over a year ago. And it was um, on my ordination, I believe, or birthday it was, uh, occasion a few years back. They made it as a surprise. And they had a video clip back then where I was some photos with my earthly mom and they were showing the, those videos and while they were singing it in the back, and the, uh, you know, as a, as a track. So um, it's very dear to my heart. Um, uh, God bless you all. God bless you all. You know, <clears throat> speaking of mothers, you will, my son and my daughter, a piece of advice from someone who is still living and standing before you. Of course, not every mother is a mother and not every father is a true father, but the title is given by God. And God said, honor your father and mother for me to bless you and give you a life abundant. He never specified respect them when they are good and disrespect them when they are bad. He said respect them, period regardless, because it is a rank that I gave, not you, my son, and what I give, if you wish for me to honor you, then you respect what I give. A piece of advice, 
We will never, we will never ever appreciate the father and the mother until we lose them. And it is with everything else in life, we will never appreciate it until we lose it. But let me tell you one thing. A genuine father and a genuine mother, parents that sacrifice their life for their children are definitely priceless. And no matter what we do as children, we will never be able to pay them back for one simple fact. What they gave us, what they offered us is priceless. Nothing can buy it. Nothing can bring it back. Nothing can replace it. And that is their life. They gave up their life for my upbringing. They gave up their life for my better future. They gave me the best of the best out of their sacrifice for years on end for me to be where I am. I became a doctor because of my parents. I became a professor because of my parents. I became a bishop. I became the Pope. I became whatever I became because of my parents' sacrifice for years on end. This nothing can buy, nothing can replace because no matter what I do and what I give for my parents, I can never bring them back to their youthhood. But one thing, I can make them forget all the hard work and all the sacrifices for many years is one thing, love. Love them, honor them, respect them because the day they go, then I'll understand what kind of a gap they have left in my life. You know, it was yesterday I remembered my earthly mother. I'll do anything and everything to have her back. But she's gone. I believe and I know she is with me in the spirit and she's praying for me because I know where she is. 100% she is in paradise with the Holy Mother. 100%. She showed me that. She proved that. But physically she is not here. I've lived all my life with my mom. From the day I was born till the day she departed from this world. I cannot look neither at her room nor at the chair she used to sit on at home till this very day. Because when, when a parent I mean, I lost my dad almost 40 years ago. So my mom, I was still a very young teenager. So I lived with my mom most of the time. Even my dad sacrificed for all of us. But the person that I lived with the most was my mother. Because the Lord took my dad 40 years ago. I was only 13, 14 years of age. So the one who raised me and became my father, my mother, was my earthly mom. She gave up on everything just to comfort us and provides life for us. This nothing can replace. This nothing can fill when that gap comes by their departure. So I beg you, my sons and daughters, love mom and dad, respect mom and dad, even when you are in disagreement with them. Do not listen to what the world teaches you by saying you're now a teenager, you're 16, you're 18, you can do whatever. No, there is no such thing. And let me tell you, the West, the East, the North and the South belong to God. That is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. So what God teaches in the East will teach in the West and in the North and the South because every corner of this world belongs to Him. But what happened? We changed. God never changes. 
We changed. We came into a society that taught us contradictive to what God teaches. I've said it before and I'll say it. The Western world has abolished family bond. It is all about individualism. They focus on the individual, not family. And this is why the West is morally bankrupt. Because God is in the family, not in the individualistic lifestyle. Individualism is selfishness. Family is sharing and caring. And that's where God is when you love and give out of love for others. That's God. So you have your parents, your earthly parents. Love them. And if you haven't spoken to them for a little while, pick up the phone and say, G'day, Dad. And G'day, Mom. Because I live in Australia. I'm an Aussie. I may not look it, but do not judge the book by its cover. I had a Barney with me. It was the other day. The little guy gave me the bullet. <laughs> Call them. Say hello to them. Visit them. Dad, do you need anything? Mom, can I help you? And if they have hurt you as parents, forgive them. Love them. Pray for them. So thank you very much, my dear Jacqueline and Eddie, for uh, this beautiful song. It um, brings back some very precious, precious memories, uh, for myself at least. So thank you so much. Um, There is one thing uh, I would like to share um, with you. Um, a very young boy uh, has put this together. It was his idea, the selection of it. Uh, you're going to see it very shortly. Um, the young boy's name is Sharbel. And uh, you probably uh, have seen him, heard of him. Is the guy that goes, wa'a wa'a duv duv to Marmari. You know, uh, he's, from all the topics we've spoken about, the only thing he's picked up on was duv duv. So uh, it's like, I'm, I must be a good teacher. That's, uh, that's what I've left him with. Wa'a wa'a duv duv, brother. There is Sherbel just walking by and looking at me. So we're going to show you this, what Sherbel has put together for me on my birthday. And then uh, we'll call it a day. So hopefully they are coming very, very shortly. Okay, let me talk to you about another topic while we're waiting. <laughs> uh, anything? Ah, here we go. Can you put your hand together for Sherbelli Sh 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 here, please? <laughs> Michael, just open this. Open this for, uh, for Sherbelli, please. Okay, I think I'm going to move this out of the way. Um, hi, Sherbelli. How are you? I love you. Um, now, this is, which is the head, which is the, uh, that's like this. Okay, let me see, let me see, let me see. No, 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 wait. Wait, 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 wait. Where is it? Is it like that? Huh? I can't see. Is it this way? I can't see, I'm going. There you go. There you go. Sherbelli, really come here. Come here. Now, as you know, that's the Lord Jesus over there. And this is my sweetheart, my Holy Mother Mary. Um, this is Saint Nectarios from our beloved Greek Orthodox Church. I love this saint. He's one of my favorites. 
I always ask him to intercede for me. Saint Nectarios from Agena is a beautiful island in Greece, and I pray when you go to Athens, it is a boat ride from Athens, depending which kind of a boat you catch, maximum 50 minute uh, beautiful ride to Agena, Saint Nectarios. Uh, my sweetheart from all the way from Lebanon, the beautiful country of Lebanon in the Middle East, the one and only Saint Sharbel, my sweet, sweet, sweetheart, Saint Sharbel. Now, the other one is from our beloved, the Coptic Orthodox Church, and this man I adore to death. His name is Saint Cyril the Sixth. And he happened to be the Pope of Alexandria for the Coptic Orthodox Church. He moved on to paradise one million percent on the 9th of March, 1971. Till this very day, his body is incorrupt. And that is not just it. Miracles of this saint, till this very day, the Lord is performing through him because he is, just like Saint Sherbel, Saint Nectarius, a true child of God and a true follower of Christ who gave his life for the Lord Jesus. This is my earthly mother. This photo, this photo was taken, she was 50 or 51 years of age. And this is the time when she arrived with her children to Australia. Uh, she was about 50 or 51. That's my earthly mother. Um, and then we have St. George there. Uh, St. Saint, Saint Rafka, yes, that's from Lebanon as well. She is my sweetheart, St. Rafka. And then we have here um, St. Saint, Saint, uh, Padre Pio. Padre Pio from Italy, amazing saint. Look him up, along with St. Rafka. And then we have St. George there. Saint Rita and Sharbel. <laughs> Sharbel is here. Um, two things I'll say very quickly. I'm so, so sorry. Today is that's a special day. Um, Padre Pio, Padre Pio and Saint Rita. They are both from our beloved, the Catholic Church. I'm Orthodox, yes? So let me tell you one thing about the Lord Jesus. He never differentiates, we do. All of these saints, both from Eastern Orthodoxy, Oriental Orthodoxy, and the Catholic Church are in paradise. What is our problem here? I don't know. So anyway, um, so I'm Orthodox, they're Catholics. Padre Pio is Catholic from the Catholic Church and Saint Rita is from the Catholic Church as well. Saint Charbel, Saint Rafka from the Maronite Catholic Church. But they come, they help me, an Orthodox bishop. Why? Because they are the children of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And so as Saint Nectarius, so as Pope Cyril VI, so as all the saints, Saint George, mighty 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 saint but i tell you one thing padre pio saint rita rotondo giovanni is padre pio in italy and cassia in italy saint rita to these two places i've been the same same thing i experienced from these two saints you know what i experienced i went to padre pio's place I came out, I was the only black sheep in the entire people that visited his holy site. Every priest there was Catholic. And they were dressed up in light gray, white, creamy color because it was summer. I'm the only Orthodox, we only dress up in black. The only color we have is black. We don't have any other colors as priests or bishops. So I was the only black sheep out of all the white sheep there. And it happened to be the Feast of the Holy Cross. So thousands of people came from all over Europe to celebrate the feast and to our blessings. I was with my earthly mother. To our blessings, it was the first time ever in 26 years they took his incorrupt body out for the public to receive a blessing from. It was that day. And they were going to put it back. So we visited, we received the blessings. We walked out, 
I came out, Italians, Europeans don't speak English. I don't speak Italian. I don't speak whatever it, language it is in Europe. They came and lined up to get a blessing from me. They're Catholics. They had all their Catholics priests and monks there with them. No, they came to this black sheep. I'm saying, Padre Pio, please, what are you doing? Leave me alone, brother. You're Italian, I'm a Syrian. No, 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 no good, no good. Eh? You do this for me, I do this for you, yalla. So anyway, I was there for two and a half hours blessing people. And the line was another two and a half hours and I wouldn't have finished. I spoke English. They spoke, Padre, come stas? Padre, no. I said, oh, yeah, God, just, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but you know what? I spoke, they understood. They spoke, I understood. Are you with me? I spoke, they understood. They spoke, I understood. And, and I don't want to say anything else because I'll upset Padre Pio. And then when I went to Cassia another time, Saint Rita, my love, my dove, Saint Rita. I love her to death. There again, after receiving the blessing, came out, they lined up. I said, what do you guys, have you found each other or something? <laughs> Mighty saints, let me call these out so you know. Pope Cyril VI, the love of my life. Marsherbil, as they say in the Lebanese accent, Habib Albi, my sweetheart. Saint Nectarios, honey. Saint Nectarios is honey, honey, honey. Padre Pio, amazing, amazing Italian stallion. Amazing, amazing saint. My mom, I'm indebted to her forever. Saint Rafka from Lebanon. Every time I went to Lebanon, I have to visit her convent. Every time I go there to her convent, I am in paradise. I don't want to leave. I don't want to leave. And every time I go there, she has to tell me something. But I won't say it. But she has to tell me something. I adore Saint Rafka. I die for St. Rafka. And she is, they're all living, by the way, please. They're praying for us. They're interceding. They are living. The Lord showed me, not anyone else. I beg you. I beg you. I beg you. Read the Holy Bible thoroughly, and you will know they are the living ones. We are the dead ones. St. George fast in his response you ask him for something it is done saint rita <sighs> yeah. she does wonders she does wonders saint charbel the junior <laughs> Now look at the junior Saint Charbel. His language is wa wa <laughs> So how do you say that in Lebanese? Habib al al albe. Habib al al albe. God bless you all. Thank you so much, and may the Lord be with you. Thank you, Charbelli. You may go with your sister. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And now we just come back to the conclusion. I'm so sorry. If you'd like to stay back. I think there's a small cake if you want to join us and um, I'd like to say hello. I speak to you as well on a social level. But if you, you want to go, I, um, I can't stop you. I love you very much. Let us now say... Is there announcements? Yes, yes. We have a spiritual picnic on August the 31st. It's a Saturday. Please put your name down. It's just a day trip. We'll be together. We'll spend a day together in the love of Christ. It is Saturday, the 31st of August. We're going on a spiritual picnic. Please put your name down. Oh, Walkathon. Our youth ministry is hosting their annual Walkathon on the 14th of September. 
For those interested in registering, please see one of the youth committee members, our Good Shepherd Youth Committee members, for a walkathon. Please join in if you'd like to lose some weight. No, just kidding. And then regain it 10 times more over when I become your chef and I'll cook for you everything that will be burned to the bone, baby. Because I don't know how to cook. It is on the 14th of September. Please put your name down for a walkathon. It's beautiful, it's fun, it's great. Youth ministry gathering, reminder again. It is on Wednesday, the 24th of July, which is this Wednesday coming. This is for the ages between 18 and 40. If you are between 18 and 40, this youth ministry is for you. Join us if you haven't joined uh, as, as yet. Uh, you can come this coming Wednesday on the 24th of July at 6.30 p.m. sharp here at the church hall. Um, our Sunday School, Divine Heart Sunday School, coming back on Sunday the 28th of July. Um, and there is a, an annual spiritual camp for our Sunday school students and teens for Christ from the ages of 8 to 17. Please put your name down. Our parents, register your children for this annual spiritual camp. And finally, the One Jesus International Conference that will take place next year from Thursday the 28th of August to Monday 1st of September. It is for five days. All of us will come together. This is open for people from Australia and abroad, for whichever country you come from. It's a five-day spiritual gathering. It's a conference, One Jesus International Conference. We'll, have, uh, we'll provide accommodation, meals, travel to venues, divine liturgy, spiritual religious lectures, contemplative prayer service, spiritual touring and retreats, educational films and seminars, you name it. So it's five days we'll be together. Please, if you are 18 plus, put your name down for this One Jesus International Conference, which is from Thursday the 28th of August to Monday 1st of September 2025. And now, if I could ask you to stand for the finale prayer, please. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned. It is in dying that we are born again to eternal life. Amen. May the Lord Jesus bless you, guide you, and protect you all the days of your life, now and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace. The peace of Christ be with you always, my beloveds. Amen.